here. We're going to be talking about the uh, Glock Smiles today. What is a Glock Smile? I'll show you. Ooh, Glock Smile. Oh, you need Glock. Glock Smile. Not to be confused though with the new Cold Steel Spartan Smile. Spartans! What is your profession? <laughs> On a more serious note, uh, we're going to be discussing today the Glock Smile as it uh, pertains to uh, brass cases, why they occur, what to be on the lookout for. Um, I was brought to this topic um, last night when I was reloading some 10 millimeter ammo for my range practice and uh, was doing some uh, case gauge uh, double checks and final um, evaluation of the brass with my old fart helpers Voila. and um, noticed something that was very troubling and a number of the rounds that I had been loading. Um, I've got a setup where um, we're going to discuss what causes the uh, block smile in a lot of cases and um, what to be on the lookout for. I'm going to show you some pretty vivid examples of what a Glock smile looks like on a, on a loaded round, um, why you want to be on the lookout for them, and uh, how to uh, try and avoid them. So without further ado, I am going to uh, reorient the camera and we're going to move to the next step here, which is uh, a look at uh, some block. All right, everybody, I've uh, got this set up as best as I can here without moving the camera too much and hopefully trying to keep everybody from getting motion sick. We're going to look at some of the basic reasons behind what causes block smiles. In this uh, frame, I've got um, three different barrels. On the right, I've got the uh, KKM barrel. In the middle, I've got a lone wolf. And on, the, on your left, it would be the standard Glock. These are all 10 mil barrels. So Glock, middle lone wolf, and to the right is a KKM. Now, what actually is a Glock smile? The, the principle behind what's happening is when Glock makes their barrels they want to build in dependability and reliability so in other words they're building a, a barrel that will go into their gun and you know that they're not going to uh, have issues with feeding and with without regard to whatever kind of ammo you're going to be using. Round nose, um, hollow points, with the exception of the lead, you know, hard cast lead bullets, which are not indicated for block barrels, that being due to the fact of their polygonal uh, rifling. Now, um, let's look at what's going on here. If you have the um, block barrel and the block barrel has a chamber that is not fully supported. And what does that mean? If I'm going to try and get some light on this and we're going to see if we can point that out. If you look at the feed ramp, you see how it opens up quickly? and right 
after the feed ramp there is uh, the chamber opens up now what that accomplishes is that without a, a tight chamber you're going to get uh, the ability for um, a multitude of different types of ammo to go through this without you know failure to feed let's look at the lone wolf right next to it you see how the feed ramp runs right up to the chamber wall there is no opening as there is on the side here you can actually see the chamber opening up almost immediately on the Glock barrel and on the lone wolf and on the KKM really tight chambers right up to the feed ramp so what does this accomplish this accomplishes a uh, tight fit all the way to the feed ramp to support the case when the round is discharged. With respect to the Glock barrel, you're going to have room right here in this area for that brass to expand. All right, so the, the explosive forces of your charge are going to send the round down the barrel, but they're also going to blow back on the case head, and you're going to get pressure buildup right, right in this area right here. Now, with Lone Wolf and KKM, you can see it's all the way right to the feed ramp, so the case is fully supported in the chamber at all times. That is why when you get aftermarket barrels, while they're fully supported, and the rifling is different, you have the uh, button pin uh, rifling in these. I don't know if I can get down there enough to show you the difference. I don't think I can in this angle, but you can almost start to see the polygonal rifling in the Lone Wolf, I mean in the Glock barrel. Completely different type of rifling. So the aftermarket barrels lend themselves to the use of uh, loading and uh, firing with uh, hard cast lead, whereas the Glock barrel is non conducive for that. Okay, so we see that the type of chamber wall on the Glock is allowing for the brass at the tail end there to expand. About that, and started checking all my other rounds, and um, found out that there were a number of them that were not good to go. So. I decided to put this together. Now, uh, it led me to another uh, idea about how to decide uh, about checking your brass, and we're going to get into that right now real quick. Let's demonstrate what's really happening to the case at this point. Uh, we've seen where it's happening. Uh, what's really going on? Okay, these, these are some fired 10 mil cases, and this is a brand new Starline. I'm going to try and do this the best I can. You look at, the, this is the new one, and this is the fired. I suffer from hand tremors, so you're going to have to bear with me a little bit. But you can see the bulging right at the base here, the case head, where it's a straight, 
straight down on the unfired brass. Let's take a reading on it. I'm going to take the fired brass and I don't know if you're going to be able to see this on camera. It is reading 0.431 0.432 All right. Unfired Starline new brass. My 4 2 1. Now Obviously you, as well as I, are aware of where that extra measurement is coming from and how to fix it in most cases. Your sizing die, if you have a full case sizing die, is going to take that 432 and bring it back to close to specs as it'll get. And this is the 432. We are now at 424. So obviously we take this take this with one of your 10 mil barrels and you can easily check as a case gauge and you can see it's good to go whereas obviously that is a no-go pretty basic things that are uh, going on there and I'm sure you guys have all seen it and are aware of it how to deal with it. My problem arose when uh, in my previous videos, like I said, I always preach, um, listen to your brass, it's trying to talk to you. In this case, my brass was screaming at me. And it was only at the last moment that I decided to pay attention, and I'm glad I did. Because it would. Well, after uh, a lot of manipulation and uh, jerry-rigging, I finally got this to come together here so you can see the elusive little guy. Um, basically, uh, you can see, let's see, I use one of my op rods here as a pointer, right there, you can see it, a grin. That's a Glock smile right there, and all that splendor and glory. And if you were to, I'm going to try not to jostle this too much, but if I spin the case around, you can see this case is right on the verge of failure. Um, literally, uh, with the load on, I was loading these practice rounds. Um, 180 grain um, jacketed hollow points at uh, 1,250 feet per second. The pressure on that uh, on that round would have um, had a major case failure on that complete separation, no doubt about it. Um, and what was kind of scary about this was that uh, all of these rounds that I have back here we're on a secondary uh, evaluation and I started to notice a reoccurring let me see if I can get another one in here for you
to. Can you see it? Right there. Not as severe, but you can start to see the the crease in the case. This is a weakening of the brass. Well, this one might have survived the... Oh, no, I spun it a little bit more. Can you see it? There it is right there. This would have been a blowout also. Okay. Um, I went through... These are all... Um, these are all reloads that... Uh, you know, I pick my brass up and uh, reload, and like everybody else does, you know, we're on our hands and knees at the uh, range, and um, you're grabbing your brass, especially, you know, like 10 mil brass, it's kind of expensive, 9 by 25 is expensive. You don't, you know, you do the best you can to get as much of your brass back so you can reload it again. Um, a good habit to get into is, you know, counting or tracking the number of times you reload, especially in these high pressure um, calibers like the 10s, the 9 by 25s, um, 40 Smith and Wessons, um, 357. SIG, any of these rounds that are running at high pressures, you want to monitor how many times you reload that. And frankly, I got a little lazy at that. And while I was, you know, mulling all this over, I came up with a pretty interesting observation. Unless you actually pick your brass up and are diligent about putting it in a box and, you know, dating it and recording that, that it was a fired brass on that date and how many times the brass has been circulated. Um, you're going to lose track of it, especially um, if you're picking up brass like 45s and, um, you know, 40 Smith & Wesson, where everybody's shooting that, uh, that caliber at the, uh, at the range. You're going to be picking up your brass. You're going to be picking up somebody else's brass. You don't know the history on their brass. Um, so it's... It's pretty difficult to uh, gauge how many times, if you lose track of your case count, how many times it's been reloaded. And then I came up with a neat little observation. All the re all of these cases that were failing have been reloaded more than once, and I began to notice that. If you look on the case head, the the mark that the extractor makes on every every gun that's fired on a semi-automatic, the extractor's going to pull that case out, and it's always going to leave a mark 99% of the time, especially on on um, right. You see the mark the extractor is making on the on the round, on the case, right there, right there. See it? Came up with a neat little easy remedy. You count the number of times that case head is uh, scratched, and you know how many times that round's been in a gun. Because I I guarantee you that the chances that a round is going to reload and the extractor is going to hit the same part of that case exactly the same place each time it goes through it's like next to zero so if for instance on this particular round I counted there was three different places that that case had been extracted and that meant I had reloaded that round three times and for a 10 mil with my loads as you can see the result is this case is done. So I figured this is kind of a neat little, uh, if you want to call it workaround, if you're not diligent in uh, tracking the number of times you're reloading. Keep track of how many different etchings are on your 
case head and you will get a pretty close idea how many times that round's been in a, in a firearm. And based on how you're loading your, your rounds, you can gauge um, what the health of the brass is. Now, let's take a look at... Alright everybody, uh, kind of moving on uh, with the Glock Smile. Like I said, it, uh, you need to be paying attention to what your brass is telling you. Uh, my brass has been screaming at me, cussing at me. I was about ready to get out the brass cleaner and clean some of their little mouths out. Turns out I should have been paying attention to them. Um, showed you uh, the developing uh, issues with a lot of my reloaded brass, the uh, Glock smiles that were forming. Now I'm going to show you what happens when you ignore your brass and um, the smile turns into your brass sticking its tongue out at you. You can see that. That, my friends, is not good. This is what happens, and you can see exactly where the smile was, and how the brass just gave up. And in checking the extractor strikes on this, case head I was sitting at uh, three so I just it goes to show you you do need to pay attention to what your brass is telling you Smith and Wessels pay attention listen to your brass look at it um, and then you'll always have the right kind of black smile y'all have a good day now